Hello guys, how are you doing? Welcome one more week to one of our amazing webinars. Thank you for joining us uh, uh, on this uh, webinar on Facebook because uh, we have a lot of people joining from everywhere. I'm seeing the comments and it's crazy. We have people from uh, the US, from Europe, from, from Africa. Oh man, this is getting crazy. And I understand why. We have an amazing speaker today with us. Uh, his name is Callum. But before we jump into the webinar, um, I want guys to um, give you a little bit more context of uh, what these events are about. Uh, so as many of you know, we organize weekly events. We have webinars. We also uh, organize a lot of Slack AMAs, which stands for Ask Me Anything. So we bring amazing product managers from the best companies in the world to talk about different aspects of the product. And we also have other type of events where um, the, the, all the audience uh, asks for uh, ask questions and, and, and our speakers answers, uh, answers all of them. So that's what we do uh, with these online um, um, events. In addition to that, we also host on-site events. We have 15 physical campuses across the world. Uh, so if you guys are located nearby any of those campuses, please check our website because we bring the best product managers in the world, I told you, uh, to those campuses to, to give uh, talks um, in person. So in addition to hosting these free events, uh, which is a great resource for all of you that are thinking of breaking into product management, we also um, organize courses. Uh, so if you want to take it to the next level and you are thinking of breaking into product management and getting a job as a product manager, that's what we do. That's what we've been doing for four years now. Um, and that's what we do. We have courses. We have five courses. The main one is about product management. And then we have four other courses um, that are called coding for managers, data analytics for managers, blockchain for managers, and digital marketing for managers. So if you guys are interested in uh, any of these courses, please go to our website, productschool.com, and then you'll see all the dates, instructors, and so on. And in addition to that, I have a huge announcement today, which is that we recently opened our online campus. This means that after four years training people on site, we have decided to take it to the next level. And now we are offering online courses. These courses are live. So it's the same experience as if you were in San Francisco, for example, but from your place, wherever you are. So as I told you, if you guys want more information, please check Product School, and then you'll see all the courses that we have, all the dates and all the instructors. So going back to today's webinar, we are pretty excited about uh, today's speaker. His name is Kevin. He's a senior product manager at Amazon, and he has a lot of years of experience as a product manager in companies such as Flipkart, Microsoft. So I'm going to let him introduce himself and take it from there. How are you doing, Karen? Karen? Hi, Fernando. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm doing good. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Yeah. All right. uh, so uh, a little something about myself uh, beyond what, uh, what Fernando said. Uh, I've been a consumer PM uh, consumer product manager for uh, a little over seven years now. And uh, um, as was just mentioned, I've, um, I've most recently, uh, I'm a senior product manager in Amazon in, their, uh, in the London office in Prime Video. And um, uh, before that, I spent about three, three and a half years with Flipkart. Uh, so it's been a while that I've been in e-commerce and uh, you'll see shades of e-commerce across this, uh, across this presentation. And uh, today we are essentially going to be talking about uh, about open web uh, per se. Let me just share. By the way, guys, um, so the format of this webinar is going to be a 20 minute presentation led by Kadan, and then we'll have 10 minutes at, at the end uh, for Q&A. So if you guys want to ask anything to Kadan, please uh, leave your question in the comments and then I will make sure I read those questions at the end of the webinar. All yours, Karen. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, great. I think everybody should be able to see the uh, see the slide now. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so let's get straight into it. Uh, growth uh, and engagement is uh, is a very active topic these days, right? Because uh, it is extremely hard to come by, and uh, given that. Uh, all of you are here uh, uh, in a product school webinar means that you actively think about it as well, or at least are curious about it. And uh, today, what we are going to do is we are going to talk about, and I'm going to talk about uh, web, especially mobile web, 
uh, and uh, how it is usually underutilized as a lever, as a very strong lever for growth and engagement, and uh, how some structured adjustments in the way we think about and analyze and build for mobile web can actually unlock uh, the power of, of this platform for you, um, for your products, for your company, uh, if you have your own product, then, th then that as well. Uh, let's... Okay, so all of us here, uh, no matter who we are, if we are, uh, we are marketing managers, or product managers, or vendor managers, or uh, even engineers and designers, we're all responsible for uh, engagement and growth of our products in one way or the other. Eventually, all our metrics roll up to engagement and growth, and uh, to may eventually we're all responsible for the success of our products. So either acquiring new users or making existing ones stick around longer and engage more with our product, right? And uh, one of the top uh, uh, channels or platforms for growth, uh, one of the largest and the uh, and the oldest uh, platforms is actually the web platform. And I've just added a small infographic here to show you that uh, even till date, uh, web has been a growing platform and uh, it is truly democratic, it's open, and uh, the number of web pages that are served to uh, to mobile phones uh, has been steadily increasing and will and will continue increasing. And uh, when I say open web, I mean um, I mean web as in uh, the web that you access through your browsers and uh, on desktop or mobile. But today we are going to be specifically talking about mobile because the issues are more uh, prominent there. Right. So even though web is actually a very, uh, uh, very potent platform and is ever increasing, it is still perceived as a platform which has relatively poorer metrics uh, as compared to other platforms. Uh, when I say other platforms, they could be um, uh, they could be native apps, they could be desktop. Uh, uh, desktop apps per se, even desktop web sometimes, and uh, probably emergent uh, platforms like uh, like chatbots or uh, or uh, uh, voice, right? Uh, so, with all this advancement uh, that is happening in the web, uh, um, there is still a huge gap in how people perceive the channels, right? And this gap is mostly due to the fact that we analyze uh, web along with um, all the other platforms and there is an apples to apples comparison right and uh, what we're going to do today is is try and dig a little deeper into that and hopefully i leave you with enough food for thought so that uh, you see the channel and uh, uh, web as a channel in a in a different light and are able to analyze uh, analyze your own platforms to uh, uh, to build better products now let's see how the situation is currently manifesting. Uh, um, uh, the the problem that I'm referring to uh, essentially manifests in a very uh, in a very standard way in most of the companies. Not every company, but most of the companies. Uh, so if you look at uh, number one, uh, this uh, you basically uh, there is an apples to apple comparison uh, with uh, with other platforms. And uh, we, we look at the metrics, we realize that the metrics are a little poor, then we prematurely conclude that this is probably because of the in-product experience uh, of, of the mobile side uh, or, or the website that you have. Uh, then we, uh, we decide to conduct a few experiments to fix that experience. Maybe it's making your form simpler or customer journey shorter, but we try and change the product itself uh, internally. And uh, we lay out experiments, and what we see is that we spend time improving the experience, and we continuously see that the efforts are not measuring up and not giving the results that we need. Right? Uh, because of this uh, happening over a period of time, uh, we conclude that uh, there is probably a ceiling to how good a mobile website can be and how good mobile web can be, and uh, and companies decide to move investment resources uh, to other platforms and uh, which is why you see mobile web teams are generally smaller than the than the other teams around and this moves like a flywheel because because of lower ex uh, lower uh, investment uh, the experience falls further and hence you basically have a negative spiral and you keep going down right? however 
there are some companies who uh, who have a better way right and uh, they seem to be increasing investments in uh, in the web rather than reducing it right now these seem to be exceptions out of the lot but uh, they know something that uh, that others don't right and uh, i want to try and open that pandora's box for you all and uh, um, and and leave you with the uh, with certain food for thought as to what these companies know uh, why they are doing better than uh, why they are doing better than others and uh, um, exactly how do you harness this power right. now uh, to understand the factors uh, affecting uh, metrics uh, i'm going to take an example of conversion rate i am an e-commerce person so uh, i'm going to use conversion rate as an uh, sorry an e-commerce person so i'm going to be using conversion rate as an example and that conversion the definition of conversion rate is if you're selling a product or a service on your website then it's the total number of sales or purchases or transactions that happen divided by the unique visitors who are visiting your site right uh, so let's go straight into it and uh, the right now the number one factor that i want to basically introduce you to is uh, uh the different kinds of visitors that uh, that visit different platforms now we when we are analyzing we sometimes uh, we sometimes assume that uh, the characteristics and the segments of users who are visiting different platforms are essentially the same right but that is usually not the case right there can be several platforms like mobile web desktop voice as i as i uh, told you before but here i'm going to use two uh, um, uh, two platform like the mobile web and native apps uh, to illustrate the point because i think all of us would be familiar with these two platforms very well now mobile web can be considered as a public place as an open mall where anybody can walk in right however uh, uh, native apps uh, uh, in comparison uh, is like a closed club with bouncers standing outside right uh, now the idea uh, the idea or the takeaway here is that native apps have a filtered set of audience and they allow only a filtered set of audience to come inside now this filtered set are those kinds of people who have decided to sacrifice their time their effort their mobile network data their storage on their phone to uh, to try out the app right so they are all they are they already have a honed intent in some way right now if you allow the best of the group to only come in then it's no surprise that uh, that group is also going to be spending a little more right that does not mean that we should not allow everybody to come in but that's just the structural difference between the two channels right um and uh, the key learning here which i want to leave you with for this particular factor is that it is not the experience that has made this difference it's a structural difference and uh, what it does is uh, essentially uh, you're allowing the best of the crowd in right and uh, best of the visitors in and hence they're going to behave in the way that that, uh, uh, that their spending power allows them which is reasonably higher so it's not the experience but it's just that you have a variability in the kind of visitors who uh, who actually visit the second factor is uh, is actually super interesting and uh, we realized this early on when we were uh, when we were analyzing but uh, we required a lot of ux research uh, and uh, talking to customers uh, uh, to uh, to understand this point really well and once it was clear it was uh, uh, it seemed obvious to us um, let me illustrate this with with a quick example Now look at the two pictures uh, that you see on the screen. Uh, the picture on the left is essentially uh, assume that to be a little busier road. Uh, let's say it's the road uh, that you take every day to go to work. And the picture on the right, it's beautiful. However, is the road that you take to your favorite holiday spot, right? Now here's a question: If you had the world's best coffee shop, right, which of the two roads do you think uh, you would get the most repeat customers? if you built your coffee shop in the two rows which one would you get the most repeat customers from and uh, uh 
most clearly most of the times i think the answer uh, answer would be unanimous that uh, it's the more busier road that we hope that uh, most uh, repeat customers would come from and uh, the the reason is pretty obvious but i'll get more into it okay? uh, i am choosing repeat customers as a metric because repeat customers as a metric or retention or frequency has a very unique characteristics and the unique characteristic about repeat customers is that all your growth and engagement metrics that you see are typically much better for repeat customers. Right? And uh, usually that is because they've already seen your product and that is hence the definition of repeat customers. They've already seen the product, they're already educated. It's not a surprise to them. And because of the fact that they've liked it, they have come back, right? So uh, let me tell you how this compares to what we're talking about right now, right? Now in your native app uh, or uh, uh, you know, in this situation of native app as a platform, if, if your phone home screen, if your phone which you have in your hand, your mobile device is a highway that you cross 100, 200 and in some extreme cases 500 times a day or, or maybe even more, uh, your mobile app that is installed is like the coffee shop that you continuously see over and over again, right? And uh, here is where the concept of growth and engagement comes in. Okay? Now, this is a positive flywheel. And if you start from number one, you will see that the more users see your product, right? Whether wantedly or unwantedly, but the more users see your product, the more they get to use your product. Right? And the more they use, the, use your product, the more habitual they get. And uh, the more habitual they get, uh, the better your growth and engagement metrics. Any metrics that you see with respect to daily active users by monthly active users or new users, or conversion rate or average time spent or, uh, or, or any other metric, you will see that all the metrics are uh, higher for repeat customer traffic, right? Uh, maybe after this webinar or, uh, uh, you know, sometime, uh, sometime um, uh, later, you can go. You can go in, and if you have access to your company's analytics, your products analytics, create a segment for repeat users and see if that is true. And I would, I would bet that mostly you would see better metrics there. For mobile web, on the other hand, there is a very key component that is missing, and that is number one. Right? Users, users don't get reminded that your that uh, your product or service is there. Users don't see it. If, if somebody is visiting your mobile web uh, mobile website, then most of the times they have decided to open the browser and they have decided to punch in the URL or they have already done some exercise before, but it's a more proactive step rather than uh, being reminded of it, right? And, uh, and, and this is very critical because the takeaway here is that once you know that this fact is uh, uh, once you know the fact that this is not because of in-product experience, right? It, it is. Uh, it is essentially again due to uh, structural differences between mobile apps and uh, uh, between mobile web. Right? And once you know this fact, then you can very specifically target this fact to improve it. Right? You can specifically target uh, the fact uh, that you have to improve visibility. Right. You can improve. You can uh, uh, you can implement uh, addition to home screen, which is which is a great new feature that most of the web browsers have started to have. Right? You can actually have presence on the home screen of of the user. You can start prompting users for that. You can have partnerships with browsers so that their own home screen has your uh, has your product. Right? You probably have to engage your marketing team there, but. Uh, uh, you can do that. You can uh, you can have associates and uh, affiliate traffic uh, where your uh, your product keeps showing up. Uh, you can analyze where your users usually go and visit, and then be there. Right. So now that you know this, you can specifically target this rather than incorrectly or prematurely conclude that it's probably something to do with uh, the experience within the product, which is probably not the case. Let's move on. Uh, the third factor which I want to share with you uh, uh, is, is basically uh, channels, the different channels of traffic which bring uh, visitors and users to your website or to your product and the different in intents that they have. Now in open web, you will see that, or rather not just in open web, in all, in, in all channels, uh, uh, you would see that uh, there are multiple traffic sources where your visitors come from. 
they can be it can be direct traffic it can be affiliate traffic it can be uh, search engines it can be via social uh, which is facebook twitter it could be via dark social which uh, which don't get tracked for example your shares via whatsapp uh they could be paid uh, um they could be paid traffic like sem ads right uh, now the key to understand here is that when you're talking about the web uh this traffic is evenly distributed across uh not really evenly but distributed across uh all the all the channels that you see right however when you look at native apps this view is slightly different you you have traffic coming in from all the channels but native apps have a unique quality uh, which is improving slowly day by day but have a unique quality that they block most of the traffic from coming in right and this is again a structural uh, structural issue with the world of native apps they are a locked in experience and you would see that although 80% of the traffic in open web is probably spread across uh, uh, across these known channels uh, 80 to 90% of the traffic in native apps would be direct or by, or via push notification if you have implemented push notes uh and uh the tricky thing here is that direct traffic and push notifications also see uh, also actually have the highest uh, uh, the highest conversion rates they also convert better they also have better engagement primarily because they have a large share of repeat traffic because of the reason that we discussed before so again it is not the experience within the product that made a difference uh, or that detracted users it's just that you have high variability in your denominator right so if you look at the if you remember the conversion rate formula you have number of transactions based on the number of uh, unique visitors your denominator is uh, uh, is 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 suddenly larger right and you have most of the conversion or most of the traffic concentrated on direct and push which convert well right so it's it's basically comes down to a game of numbers so this is the third uh, third factor and here now that you know the fact you can then focus on it you can focus on building more direct traffic on on mobile web you can focus on uh, experiences that probably enable web push notifications which is again a new thing which is a very potent channel not many websites and not many mobile websites have actually implemented it and uh, you still have a very good advantage to to use that channel right so uh, if you don't know these factors or you've not analyze the traffic sources then again we can be incorrectly conclude that might be the experience after users land in whereas in reality uh, the the metric lowered even before the visitor actually had the chance to reach a product right? the fourth factor that i want to share with you is experience but not quite in the way uh, as we have spoken about it right now uh and what i mean by that is uh that mobile web uh and i have been um, uh i've been lucky to be a part of uh, several uh, studies and several researches where we have come to understand that mobile web uh, in mobile web people um people have a lower perception of uh, reliability security uh overall experience and performance right and in reality although that is not true but uh in the world of uh, of consumer internet products sorry in the world of consumer internet products perception is reality so we have to build towards how customers uh, how customers perceive you right and uh, not to get too much into experience but just to give you an idea of why people perceive it that way uh if you compare it again with native apps native apps have uh, have an end to end experience edge to edge experience you don't see url bars Uh, on mobile web to have a lot of uh, um, um, how do i say a lot of frame of the browser uh, and it seems as if it's a third party experience and uh, on mobile web you see white pages i am uh, before uh, between page transitions and i'm sure a lot of you have seen the fa uh, the famous chrome dinosaur when your mobile network is weak okay? so all these things uh, all these things make a difference right and mobile web's perception goes down uh, but uh, the learning here is this to improve these things there are uh, the technology has advanced sufficiently on mobile web that you can now have an experience which is exactly like uh, like native apps 
However, to make that happen, you need a lot of JavaScript magic. But a side effect of Java of, of uh, jumping straight into JavaScript and uh, creating a great experience is that JavaScript also deteriorates, massively deteriorates the performance of your web page if not done intelligently, right? So there are there are certain ways where uh, you cannot sacrifice performance, but usually companies don't focus on that and uh, they basically jump into creating that interactive 60 FPS smooth animation experience. Um, and the takeaway is that, uh, or, the, or the hidden learning here is that you need to build in uh, in-house JavaScript experience within your engineering and product teams so that you know, so that you can improve the performance of your uh, mobile web product without sacrificing, uh, without sacrificing performance. And, uh, and mind you, performance is uh, is actually a feature, right? Uh, I would uh, I would suggest that whenever you are uh, you are prioritizing uh, features and functionalities and efforts for your product, always keep performance as one of the number one features because uh, decrease in performance will give you the largest decrease in your metrics, and the reverse is also true. If you improve performance, you will see a much better improve. Most of the times, you would see a much better improvement than than a feature right and uh, this is again a good open secret let's go to the fifth factor the fifth the fifth factor is uh, is pretty interesting and uh, this is about cookies and usually uh, this is not uh, this is not analyzed and it usually gets missed but an important uh, uh, important stat here is that about 30% of internet users delete their cookies every and this number can usually go up by 40% in first world countries or, uh, uh, sorry, uh, in developing countries such as India, China, Indonesia, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, these are the places where uh, you would see a lot of cookie clearing happening. And you can see that one of the top apps in the world for cookie clearing is Clean Master, which has about 500 million installs. Uh, now, the thing to understand here is that when you when users clear a cookie, the next time they visit a website, they are considered as as a brand new visitor. Right? And uh, analytics uh, analytics softwares cannot differentiate between the previous visit and the and this one. And they um, uh, and this increases the number of unique visitors. And what happens is that uh, if you remember the conversion rate formula again, this inflates the number of users in conversion calculations. So. To do a quick back in the envelope, you will realize that uh, about 20% uh, inflation in unique visitors will decrease your percentage by 18%, your conversion rate by about 18%, 17%, up somewhere in that uh, ballpark. And uh, this is a very critical factor. Now, what you can do about this is that you can predict it, you can adjust your formula and get the real conversion rate rather than the artificial one. If you don't go there, then you again incorrectly conclude that something to do with the product, which is clearly not the case. Uh, the last factor that I want to leave you with is uh, is that not all traffic is human traffic, and this is again this again shows up in uh, data analytics. Uh, but we need to go a lot deeper to understand which what kind of traffic this is. And I'm referring to bot traffic, like search engine crawl crawlers, scrapers fetchers, uh, spammers, etc. Now these visits again should not be part of your denominator, right? Because they have zero percent chance of converting, and they are not real humans. No matter what you do, you cannot you cannot make a robot buy something, right? and uh, your denominator inflates again. This again has the same effect. So imagine if you have a twenty percent bump in unique visitors, you will realize that your conversion rate drops by about eighteen. 17, 18%, uh, which is actually really big. 18% uh, growth in conversion rate takes years. Right. There are several other factors as well, like JavaScript errors and uh, building for browsers, which we personally use rather than what we think the users are using, et cetera. But uh, you know, now that you know that uh, you know the analysis is probably the culprit and not product experience, you can now go ahead and find your own uh, reasons for your own product. But uh, hopefully, this should have left you with uh, sufficient food for thought. Uh, this is a quick recap of what we discussed as to what are the actions that you can take for each factors. In the interest of time, I'll move on. 
but uh, yeah, the top takeaways is deep dive and understand the why behind the numbers before jumping to a conclusion, because it can it can be very costly for you in the long term or costly for the product. Uh, it's it always helps to educate your leadership, to educate your teams and your stakeholders on the structural differences between platforms, so that they also understand how to what to expect out of uh, out of metrics uh, from each platform. Build in-house JavaScript expertise. We've spoken about it. Adjust your metric calculations based on the insights that you got, uh, so that you see the real conversion rates and you can see a true apples to apples comparison rather than the rather than the big gap and uh, ensure that whatever you learn turns into rapid hypothesis, into rapid experimentation, and show continuous improvement by, uh, by building these into your product, because only then you will be able to build trust in your company and, uh, and you can use mobile web in the way that it should be used and you, know, you can get the value that you, that you, really, that you really can appropriate out of it. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, I hope this leaves you with uh, with good food for thought, so that you can go back to your uh, products and uh, uh, and and analyze it well, uh, and look for these hidden secrets uh, to improve conversion and explain to others that what needs to be done. Thank you. That was that was great, Karan. Uh, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Uh, everybody loved it. Uh, so now we still have uh, a few minutes for uh, a couple of questions. So I'm going to be reading some of the questions from the comments. Um, so the first one is from Michael. And he's um, asking, thanks, a uh, question. What's your stance on mobile web versus native app as a starting point for a startup with small budget? Sorry, can you repeat the last part, starting with? So um, what's your stance on mobile web versus okay native app as a starting point for a startup with small budget? Right. Uh, well, I would, uh, what I would suggest is, uh, it depends on the industry that you're in. Right? And uh, in some of the industries, in most of the industries where, uh, where your product might not be a daily scenario, or uh, you don't have enough reasons for uh, for customers to keep keep your product on uh, you know on your phone and your startup. I would suggest uh, experimenting with mobile web first because you're a startup. You're looking for product market fit, and you wouldn't want to invest your energy in trying to promote uh, uh, promote something that users would immediately uninstall. On the other hand, if you're into messaging apps and if you're into into apps that uh, you think that users will um, uh, will benefit from keeping on your phone, then go ahead and build a native app. But uh, please customize your strategy for the industry that you're in and optimize for learnings. Nice. Okay, uh, Diane is asking, could you explain what level of user experimentation do you do? In-house user experiments or focus groups? In-house user experiments or focus groups? Okay, so uh, the so user experiments are uh, essentially of two types. Uh, what we do, it's it's quantitative and it's qualitative. Right? And uh, with quantitative, we basically have A/B experimentations and uh, we we launch MVPs or products to figure out uh, to figure out whether a particular feature is working uh, working or not. Uh, but with respect to qualitative, qualitative isn't just focus groups. There are several ways. There are customer service. If you have a customer service department, then they can be a feed, uh, they can be a source of qualitative feedback. Uh, you can go and reach. You can go and call customers, uh, ask them questions. You have usability studies. You have, and then you have focus groups as well, and uh, uh, in office sessions where you can call them and talk to them and look at how they actually use your uh, use your product or probably wireframes or your product. So uh, there are several uh, several things that you do, uh, but uh, it depends on the time you have. It depends on the criticality of the product that you're launching. Sometimes the effort is low and you can just launch and, and launch and see how it's doing. Sometimes the effort is high and you would rather de-risk early on by talking to customers before launch. So depends on the stage of the product uh, development life cycle that you are in and the criticality of the feature you're trying to do. Great. And unfortunately, we are running out of time, uh, Karan. So I have one last question for you. This is the question that I always ask to all of our speakers, uh, which is, 
What would be your biggest piece of advice for those who are thinking of breaking into product management and get a job as a product manager? Right. Uh, so uh, I would, uh, right. So there are the usual suspects about uh, about customer empathy, working backwards from the customer, understanding exactly what the customers need, uh, depending on data and analysis rather than your own opinions. But, but uh, a slightly different uh, differentiated advice that I would give, which I usually give to PMs who ask me this question or, or aspiring PMs is that get into the mindset of ownership. And what that means is uh, is that there is no job that is probably not yours, right? So if there is an issue in marketing, uh, in product marketing, then you have to take ownership of it. You have to work with stakeholders. Uh, if, uh, if there are issues in product, you have to take ownership, uh, ownership of it, right up to testing, launch, analytics. You have to make sure that you're in the mindset of ownership, you're in the mindset of leadership uh, to make sure that no aspect uh, no aspect is overlooked. And uh, I think this is critical because usually we start thinking in terms of functions. I'm a marketing person, I'm a vendor person. And uh, we don't think uh, from a holistic point of view. And uh, I, would, I would really suggest getting into those shoes and being comfortable with having a lot of accountability. Great, thank you. That's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing advice. Uh, thank you so much, Kana, for all your insights. They were very helpful, uh, everybody loved it. So thank you very much for taking the time to, to, to be with us uh, today. It was uh, great. Um, so, so yeah, uh, before we wrap up, um, as you guys know, we organize these events on a weekly basis. So stay tuned. Uh, you can go to productschool.com and see what the upcoming webinars and AMAs we have um, for the upcoming weeks because we have great speakers um, coming up. So in addition to hosting this free event, we also organize uh, courses. All our courses are part-time. Um, and what we do here is we train people on how to become a product manager. We have five courses. The first one is about product management per se. And then we have four other courses about coding for managers, data analytics for managers, blockchain for managers, and digital marketing for managers. We have 15 campuses um, worldwide. And we recently opened our online campus. This means that now you can learn product management wherever you are. So if you guys want more information about the on-site events, on-site courses, uh, online courses, we have all the information on our website, productschool.com. So I just invite you guys to, to go there and check all the stuff that we have because it's pretty hot. So thank you guys for, for being here uh, one more week. I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Karen. Take care. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh,